As Christians, we got to wrestle with what it means to be the church, not just with our ideas of it. We got to wrestle with questions like, what constitutes a local church? And what does it mean to be the church? Jesus and His Church is a sermon series where we'll biblically explore what the church is, why it exists, and what it means for us. Alright, this week's sermon is Jesus gave baptism to His church. Jesus gave baptism to His church. It's week number eight in our series called Jesus and His Church. We're looking to the Bible to answer these questions of what is the church? Who makes up the church? What is the mission of the church? All this kind of stuff. So we always want to look to the Bible at Ecclesia because we love the Bible and we believe that this is the Word of God breathed out to us and given to us so we can know who God is, what He requires, what He provides, how He is glorified, and how we're created to be. Amen? We believe the Bible's true. So we're going to keep looking to the Bible as long as we're here, as long as I'm alive, we're going to keep opening the Bible and talking about Jesus. So this week, well, last week we looked at Jesus gives what? Preaching. Jesus gave preaching to his church. And so this week we're looking at the fact that Jesus gave baptism. So if you've got a Bible, grab it. If you've got a phone, get on it and go to Romans chapter 6. That's where we're going to start today. And as you're getting there, I just got a question for you to get you thinking about this and kind of preface where we're going. You guys with me? What comes to mind when you hear the word baptism? Do you think, some of you may be saying baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe some of you think about the time when you were baptized in water. Maybe some of you, I asked a few people this this week, so what, you, what comes to mind? Like just baptism. What just came to your mind? Water. All right. Um, does it come to your mind, babies being baptized? If you've seen the movie The Godfather, it's kind of crazy, and this baby's being baptized in the Catholic Church, and then everyone's being killed outside. It's all crazy. No one? Yes. Have I seen that? Yeah, interesting. Maybe you think about infants being baptized. Maybe you were baptized as an infant. Or maybe you just think of the time you were baptized. Maybe you think of some of the times in the Scripture, like Philip, when he shares the Gospel with this Ethiopian official, and the official's like, there's some water right here. Can I be baptized? Philip goes, yep, let's do it. What, what, I, what I want to put forth to you is that a lot of things in the scripture, or we hear these words, they trigger different things in our mind, right? What I want and what I hope happens at the end of today and for the rest of your life, when you hear the word baptism, you think about Jesus. And I don't mean that in the sense of Sunday school answer, what, you, what comes to mind when you think of a chair? Jesus, he's the chair that holds us up. I don't mean like in this corny way, but I want you to understand what baptism is, what it's a picture of, how significant it is. So we're going to look at that today. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to be in Romans 6, starting with verse 3. You guys ready? I'd encourage you to be praying with me. Pray for yourself and pray for those who are around you. Pray for those who maybe will listen or watch a sermon later, that God would grow them. And that he would open their eyes to the truth of baptism and give us joy in knowing what the Bible says. Cool? So be praying all throughout. I'm going to pray first now. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you've given us your word. I admit to you that I have no ability or power to effectually change anyone. That I have nothing within myself that can change hearts or advance your kingdom. And so I pray and ask that you would give me the strength and that you would speak through me and that you would speak to your church, Ecclesia, and that you would give us a word this morning, that you would change hearts, that you would push your kingdom forward and expand your kingdom by saving people that are not connected to Jesus or by saving those of us who are already saved from the penalty or of sin, and you would save us continually from the power and presence of sin, that you would grow us by grace. And so I trust that your word being proclaimed, it will not return to you void. We thank you that you've told us that. So I'm going to passionately preach, Father God, and I invite you to work through me, work in me, and work in the hearts of all those who hear this good word. Father, help me to have the grace and courage to proclaim the truth of the gospel like it's the last time that I will ever preach. For your glory and for our continuing and ongoing joy in Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. 
All right, Romans chapter 6. We're going to get right to it. Romans 6, 3 through 7. I want to ask and then seek to answer six questions about baptism. Okay, so that's where we're moving today. I want to ask questions that maybe you've thought of, or definitely people will ask you at some point, or people maybe think of these. So I want to equip you to answer these for yourself, and equip you to be able to talk to other people about what baptism is all about. When you think about baptism, do you ever just think, I mean, if you grew up in the church, it's just kind of a normal thing, right? But do you ever just step back and think, this is freaking weird. We get a tank, or a, we've got a horse trough, or we have this baptismal built into our church, or we go to a swimming pool or something, and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we dunk people under the water. Do you ever just think, that's really weird? It is. It's a weird thing. And as we'll look at the scripture, baptism makes absolutely no sense outside of Jesus. So remember that a lot of the things that we do, the fact that you're in here right now and you're sitting in these chairs and you got your Bible in your lap and you're listening to a guy preach to you for an hour, that's weird. Like you say, hey, I'm going to go gather this building and then we're going to sing. And who are you singing to? Or why are you singing? We're singing to Jesus. Well, that's weird. All this stuff that we do as a church, it doesn't really make any sense outside of the truth of Jesus. And baptism, especially, it's just kind of a hot tub party. Or it's maybe the first bath that you've had in a while. So I want to ask and seek to answer six questions. The first question is, what is baptism? What is it? What is it all about? Let's, I'm going to read Romans 6, 3-7, and then we're going to walk through this to help you guys understand. Cool? It's not up on the screen, so grab your Bible and read with me, and I want you to look at the truth of the Word. This is what Paul says to the church in Rome. This is the Word of God. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him, therefore, by his, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. This is the word of the Lord. I want to point out to you a few things that we look at. First of all, we see what is baptism? What, what does Paul say? He starts with baptism is all about Jesus. He starts in verses 3 and 4. Read them with me again. Look at, look at what he says. Do you not know? First of all, he assumes that if you're a Christian, you've been baptized. This is not an option. If you're a Christian, you've been baptized. He assumes that all of you Christians in Rome, Paul's never been to Rome, and he's writing from hundreds of miles away, and he's saying, he's explaining to them, this is what baptism is a picture of. He's talking to them about, we don't continue to sin so that grace may abound and say, well, God's grace covers more than anything we could ever do, so let's just keep sinning. We'll say, man, God's so gracious. No. And he goes into teaching them what baptism is a picture of. First of all, notice he just assumes if you say you're a Christian, you've been baptized. It's a command by Jesus to be baptized. So, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into who? Christ Jesus. We're baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The Apostle Paul says this, starting out talking about baptism. This is the only spot in the book of Romans, I believe, that he talks about baptism at all. And he brings it up as a, this is what it's a picture of. This is what it's a symbol of. This is how you do it and why we do it and what it means. He says baptism is all about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Baptism is a picture that Jesus was alive. Jesus really died on the cross for our sins, and then he was taken and buried. Jesus really died. Islam and Muslims try to say that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just swooned on the cross and he passed out. And then they took him and it was a conspiracy and he didn't really die. And so three days later, yeah, he arose, but he wasn't really dead. He died. It was a historical fact. Jesus actually died and he was buried. <laughs> when 
three days later, we know the reason the news is good news is that Jesus didn't just die and was buried for our sins, but three days later, he what? He got out of the grave and started walking around and talking to people and having meals with people and telling Peter to cast his net on the other side of the boat and you'll get a bunch of fish and then he feeds them breakfast. Jesus hung out with people. And Christianity exploded onto the earth and still is to this day because it's a historical fact that Jesus died, was buried, and got out of the grave. So Paul is telling us that baptism is first and foremost about Jesus' life, death, burial, and his resurrection. You with me? That's what he says. Jesus died, was buried, and comes back to life. So it's about Jesus. Number two, what we see baptism is all about Baptism is about our spiritual death to sin and new life with Jesus. Read it again with me. All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul's talking about baptism is about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and it's about our spiritual death to sin, burial with sin, and new life that we get to walk in with Jesus. That our old self, our sin nature, and the sins that we have committed and that we are accountable for and that we would be judged for, when Jesus died, those sins died. If you're in Christ, your sin died at the cross. And your baptism is a picture of, I trust in that. That Jesus was crucified in my place, that he was buried, and my sin, therefore, was buried with him. And when Jesus got out of the grave, my sin did not. That's what baptism is a picture of. So then we can walk in newness of life. Because Jesus is alive, you can live a new life. All of us can live a new life. And if you're in Christ, you know that. And you probably sense that, and maybe you haven't really thought through it, but just (coughs) think of who you were and what you wanted and what your desires were before God saved you by his grace in Christ. And now that you're in Christ, you go, everything is different. I want different things. I just, I want Jesus. I want to serve Jesus. I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to love my city like Jesus has loved me, right? These are motives, and these are things that don't come from someone who's still dead in their sin. It comes from someone who has died and been raised to walk in newness of life because Jesus died and was raised to walk in newness of life. You with me? It's about Jesus, death, burial, resurrection. It's about your and our, all of those who hope and trust in Christ as Savior. It's about our spiritual death to sin and able to... Come up and walk and live in a new life for the glory of Jesus and our joy in him. With me? We go to the next verse. Let me, sorry, before we go to the next verse, I'm getting off my notes a little bit. But I want want to put a few things forward to you. Since Jesus died and was buried, we and our sins died and were buried. Baptism shows that, right? Are you scared? Of your sins defining you. <clears throat> Are you scared of the fact that your mess ups and your screw ups and your sins, like there's things that you've done that you, you just can't shake, that that's going to define you because you did that? A lot of people walk through this life, and even though they know they've been saved by Jesus, they're still marked by a, yeah, but I'm still, I did that. Are you scared of your sins defining you and you not being able to shake that? Let's say to you, in Christ, your sin's dead. It was buried with Jesus. And it stayed in the grave when Jesus got out of it. You're not defined by your sins. You're not defined by your good works or your bad works or your apathy. You're not defined by that anymore. If you're in Christ, you're defined by Jesus' death and resurrection for you. New life. Your sins don't have to define you anymore. So stop letting them. Stop letting what you did last week, or what you did a few years ago, or what you did when you were a teenager, stop letting that define you in some way of, yeah, but I'm that. Maybe it was this morning. 
Maybe wife or husband, you were mean this morning. Maybe it was this week with a friend or a spouse or someone at work that you don't have to let those shortcomings and those sins, they don't define you anymore. So don't think like they do. Jesus has been raised to life, and so you too have been raised to life, and your sin is done. That's a beautiful picture of the gospel, is that we don't deserve any of this, right? We don't deserve any of it. We didn't deserve to be saved then. We don't deserve to be ongoing, saved from the power of sin over our lives, and to not be defined even by our failures now. We don't deserve that. But we get it. Because Jesus is alive, we get to walk in newness of life, and we're not defined by our sins. You with me? If you've seen the movie The Patriot, any of you guys seen that movie? Great movie. I love that. I love Mel Gibson and his movies. They're good stuff. I know Mel can be kind of a crazy person, but I like The Passion of the Christ. I like Patriot. Patriot's one of my favorite movies. And if you've seen it, maybe you'll remember this. This always stuck with me since I was a little kid, and I saw this when I was like, I don't know, 10. This stuck with me, and I saw that, and it scared me when I heard him say this. This is how the movie begins, and this is how the movie ends. Benjamin Martin is the main guy in the movie, right? And he says, I have long feared that my sins would return to visit me. And its cost is more than I can bear. You ever feel that? I've long feared that my sins, the things that I've done, they're going to come back on me. <coughs> maybe someone's going to find out just how bad I am. Or maybe this is going to come back and karma is going to come around and it's not going to work out well for me because I did this back then. This is anti-gospel. This is anti-good news. If you're in Christ. But I say to you, if you're not in Christ, if you're not inside a loving and a personal relationship with living faith in the living Jesus to save you from your sin, your sins will return to visit you. And the cost will be more than you can bear. You cannot bear the full weight of your own soul and you will be judged because God is good. And he does not sweep sin under the rug, but he met it head on at the cross and says, believe in Jesus. Come to Jesus. Receive Jesus. It's finished. Trust. But for those who are outside of a relationship with Jesus, your sins will return to visit you and the cost will be more than you can bear. But those of us who are in Christ, we know that's true, but because of Jesus, our sins will not return. They, have, they are as far as the east is from the west. They were buried, and Jesus is alive, and our sin is still dead and gone. Are you with me? Spiritually alive. Our sins will not return to visit us. You don't you're not defined by your sin anymore. You're defined by what Jesus has done on your behalf. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism is about our physical death and resurrection with Jesus. He says, if we've been united with Jesus and we've died like this, we're surely going to be united with him in a resurrection like his. Jesus' resurrection was he died for our sin. And so you and I, because of our sin, we will die someday. You will physically die unless Jesus comes back before you die. And that's even kind of, we don't know how that's going to happen. The Bible's not really clear on how that's going to happen. We just know Jesus is going to come back. He's going to win. We don't know all the details of the in-betweens. But he's going to come back, and we will be resurrected with him. Have you ever feared death? Maybe some of you still feel fear death. I used to lay awake at night when I was growing up, when I was a kid, and even in high school and stuff, and I used to just lay awake, and I couldn't go to sleep, because I couldn't stop thinking about what happens when you die. And I grew up in the church, and I would heard what people were saying happens when you die, right? But I'm still thinking, but what happens? How do I know what happens? Christians say they know what happens, but how do I know? Maybe some of you have struggled with that too. And, and maybe it's not necessarily like, I'm going to go to hell when I die, but it's like, it's the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen. This is going to be crazy. I think about that sometimes. If I were to die this week, I'm like, whoa, it kind of freaks you out, right? My mom grew up in a non-Christian home. 
Her dad was in the military and was very uh, emotionally and verbally abusive to the family. So my mom grew up, my mom was, she's a beautiful lady, still is beautiful, but she was very beautiful in high school and a leader, and then she gets into college and she's like in the newspaper <coughs> every week, and she's who's who of her college, and she's the president of her sorority and all of these things, but if you talk to my mom today, she wasn't saved until she was 23. She had nothing to do with the church. And then something happened, and she ended up at a crusade one Sunday night, and this dude preached the gospel, and then invited people, if you want to come to Christ, if you want to be saved, come forward at the end, and we'd love to talk to you and share with you. So my mom comes forward, and they say, what decision have you come forward to make? And those of us who grew up in the church, we know they're asking, like, are you here to rededicate your life? Are you here to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior by praying the sinner's prayer? Are you, you know, all this stuff, whatever decisions, do you feel a call to missions, right? It's usually called ministry, rededication, or salvation, right? They asked my mom, what, what decision have you come to make? She said, all of them. <laughs> I don't know. I need Jesus. <laughs> but if you talk to my mom, she'll tell you that from about the age four until she was 23, she had ongoing panic attacks, fearing <coughs> death, fearing what happens when you die. She said, it wasn't really like I was fearing going to hell. Because I just assumed, you know, I was a pretty good person, so I'd go to heaven or something like that. But I just feared, like, ceasing to be and the unknown, right? If you're in Christ, you will die because of sin. Every one of you will die, unless Jesus comes back and gets us before. But if you're in Christ, you will be resurrected and given a new body and resurrect to eternal life. <coughs> with Jesus, to be like Jesus forever. We know what happens when we die because Jesus died and got out of the grave and tells us, this is what happens when you die. Well, I can trust him. He died. And he's alive, showing he conquers over sin. He conquers over death. And so we can trust Jesus because he resurrected. People think that Christians are bold or arrogant to say this is what happens when you die for everyone. You will die and be judged and you will either go to hell for torment or heaven for blessing. And Jesus is the only way that you will go to heaven. Jesus is the only way you'll be united with him because we have rebelled against God and our sin has separated us from God. So we say you will either arise to torment or arise to blessing. And people say, that's so arrogant that you say that. It's all speculation. No one knows. Because no one's died and been able to come back and tell us. That's what they say. And we just go, excuse me, actually Jesus did die. And Jesus arose. And he tells us that we're going to die, but we're going to arise to be like him. You will get out of your grave someday. If you if you're cremated and you're spread all out, I don't know, your ashes are going to go and boom, and then you're together. You're going to arise from death to eternal life with Jesus. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear it because Jesus tells us what happens. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will surely be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism shows that. Jesus died, was buried, and rose. We spiritually die, we're buried, and we arose, and we will physically, because of sin, we will die, we will be buried, or spread, and we will arise. The good news of the gospel is that there's no like mystery about, about what we're longing to know. What happens when I die? Well, if you're with Jesus, you're going to arise to be with Jesus and like Jesus, sinless perfect with him, enjoying him forever. This is good news. Baptism shows that. Moving to the next few verses, read with me. Romans 6, 6 and 7 says, We know that our old self, or maybe your translation says our old, the old man, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. 
Amen? Amen. That's such good news. And I want you, I need you to understand this. I need you to understand what Paul is saying here because most Christians don't really live in the truth of what Romans is saying right here. Anitra knows this for sure. I've talked to Anitra about this, and she said, growing up, I was in my 20s or so, I don't know when, how old she was, until I realized I've been set free from sin. I don't have to say yes to sin anymore. I've been free. When the Bible uses the, the term and the word enslaved, track with me. It, it's not speaking like we were enslaved to sin, like we didn't want to sin, but the devil's guarding us and he like won't let us get out. We're like, I want to do good. I want to love Jesus. And he's like, no way, no way. <laughs> it speaks of it in the terms of, stay with me, it speaks about addiction. Being enslaved, something is your master and rules you and you serve it and you love it and you're addicted to it. So when Paul says that we were enslaved, but we've been set free, so we're no longer enslaved, he means something supernatural has happened in us that have been saved by God's grace through the work of Jesus that has freed us from being enslaved to sin and has made us, Romans 6 goes on to say, a slave to righteousness. If you're in Christ, you don't have to say yes to sin. You don't have to. <coughs> I know for some of us, we go, it sure seems like I do. A lot of times, though. If you're in Christ, because Jesus put sin to death, you can put your sin to death. You've been freed from being enslaved. You're not bound by it anymore. And I want to help you understand this. I want to give you just an example, and I want you to think, think through this stuff. That What Paul says, baptism is about our freedom from sin in this life. Not just one day we'll die and go be with Jesus and we'll be completely free of sin, which is the truth of the gospel. That's the final stage of how many of you would say it's good news that one day I'm going to be resurrected like Jesus, never to sin again? Oh my gosh. Those of us who are in Christ, in our heart we say, I hate sin. I hate it. I love Jesus. I want to serve Jesus. And we hate sin so much because we want to love Jesus and serve Jesus. And we still see in our life that there's a lot of times that I don't. And that I sin. We hate it. Amen? One day you'll be completely free from it. That's the good news of the gospel. For all those who come with nothing in their hands and come and cling to the cross of Jesus as the only thing, you will be free from sin. But if you need to know that the good news is for right now. The good news is for today. That you have been set free from being enslaved to sin right now. You can say no to sin. You have the Holy Spirit, if you're truly in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He has been made one with you. He has regenerated your heart. That means he has caused a new birth to happen. That's what Paul's talking about. Our old self, who we were, we were born with a sin nature, and we were born ever since we could make a choice, we chose to sin. Before we were saved, we had never done anything but sin. Because that which does not, not proceed from faith in Jesus is sin. The scripture says in Romans 14. This is the radical thing that you probably, and maybe some of you are like, what is he talking about? Those outside of Christ have never done anything. Anything but sin. Before you were saved by grace through faith in Jesus, you'd never done one thing but sin. Even the quote-unquote good things you had done, it wasn't from a right relationship with God for the glory of Jesus, enjoying Jesus and being obedient to Jesus. Therefore, it was missing the mark. It was sin. But you've been set free from that. Your old nature has been killed. The way we know that is because Jesus was killed. He took our sin on himself, was condemned in the flesh as we should have been condemned. He died, and so did your sin. And when the Holy Spirit comes and he gives you a new heart, and he changes you, and you start, <clears throat> I love Jesus. I, I want Jesus. How many of you, when you look back at 
Maybe some of you can't really pinpoint when God converted you to a Christian. But you can probably look back to a year or two time that's like, in that time, I started wanting Jesus. I started really trusting in what he had done and not what I could do for him, but what he had already done for me. That's God killing your old self right now because Jesus was killed for it. The Holy Spirit comes in, puts that to death, makes you alive in Christ so that you're no longer enslaved or addicted to sin. I'll say this. What are you addicted to? I would imagine not a lot of us are addicted to drugs or alcohol, but maybe. For a lot of us, the things that we can be addicted to is praise of man, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vine. We're getting our joy from those things, and those are those take precedence in our life. It's like, I want to do that. As soon as you wake up, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, cool. I'm there with you, too. we got to battle this stuff. What are you addicted to? You don't have to be addicted to that. You can say no to that, and you can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to free you from that. <coughs> because Jesus died for sin, you can put your sin to death. There's good news for us that those of us who we know, there are certain things that all of a sudden it's like, ah, I'm addicted to this. I, I, my day wouldn't be fulfilled unless I did this. I'm not talking about studying your Bible or loving or kissing your wife or your husband. Like, oh, I'm addicted to reading my Bible because if I don't read my Bible, I'm like, oh man, I should have read my Bible. I can't be addicted to that. No. What are you addicted to? Do you know people that are addicted to certain things, whether it be shopping, whether it be seeking the praise of men, whether it be Christian ministry, whether it be worshiping their husband or wife or their family or whatever, they can be freed from that. I've got some friends that are addicted to certain things that are just mastering their lives, and I know it, and I love them, and I've been praying for them and sharing the gospel with them, and I'm praying for God to set them free from that, and he can do it. I expect him to. I met with a buddy last night that been loving and hanging out with, and I know he's not in Christ, but he's very familiar with the church and all that stuff. Just been sharing the gospel with him and talking to him about Jesus and talking to him about Jesus. And finally, last night, I just came out and told him, like, can I be honest with you? I'm like, of course. I've been praying for you for a long time that God would save you from your sin and connect you to Jesus. I just want you to know, that's what I'm praying for. That's not the only thing I'm praying for for you. I love you. I'm, I'm praying for your joy. But that's going to happen as you're connected to Jesus. And he starts saying, like, I know you care about me. And you've been praying for this stuff. And I can see the Holy Spirit working in his life and starting to cause some things to change. And I pray to God that he regenerates him. We need God to do this. A supernatural work needs to happen in each of us to be connected to Jesus. I've been praying for him to be set free from his slavery to sin. You ever fear that you can't change? You ever fear that there's something in your life that's like, I don't know if this is ever going to change. I don't know what for me. Let's talk about me. I don't know that I'm ever going to be patient. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm so impatient. I want things to happen right now. I find myself when I'm driving the car and like on York Street, someone's going to turn right, and there's that little green arrow that says you can go, and a lot of people don't notice it now. So they're just sitting there, like it's red. Always oh, like, light's green, light's green, blood, 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 blood. It's like, that's like four seconds. If you know me, you'd probably say, yeah, Brett's not very patient. He's not even very patient in listening. He's like, uh, uh, let me talk. But I'm seeking after patience, and I know that God, by his grace, will change me. What is it that you fear? I can't I can't shake this. You can change. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you if you're in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, He can. You can be saved right now. Trust in Jesus. Believe on Jesus and what He's done in your place for your sins to reconcile you to God. It's all grace. It's just faith. Believe. 
You can be saved right now. Some of you can be saved from the things you're going through right now that you're struggling with or you're addicted to or you want to change it. You can be free from that right now. Ask God to do it. I know the things in my life that there was a pattern um, when I was a young teenager and when I was an older teenager and even in the first part of when we got married that there was a pattern in my life of lust and pornography and just looking to whatever I could get. And I tell you, by God's grace, he has grown me in that. And what I am today, if I were to look back then and said, you'll be like this when you're 26, I'd say, there's no way. There's no way I, can, I can't shake this. I can't stop. So it really came to the point where I just said, God, I can't stop. I can't. I can't put this sin to death. Would you kill it? Would you free me from this? And as soon as I started just, I can't do it. I need you to. I can't. I'm trying. I'm going to keep trying, but I need you to do it. As soon as that happens, God goes, okay, now you get it. And started just changing my heart. And I tell you this, so it's an encouragement to you. Whatever you feel like you can't stop doing, you can. Pray. Talk to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to bless you and to change your heart. That only he can do that. We can change our actions, but only he can change our heart. Because Jesus died and arose, we're not enslaved to sin anymore. Amen? That's good news. This is what baptism shows. Jesus was alive, died, buried, and arose. It's real. He conquered. You spiritually, those who are in Christ, you died, were buried, and arose to walk in a new life, free from sin, not addicted to sin anymore, not enslaved by sin, not captured by it. It also shows that we're going to die, and we will physically one day arise to be with Jesus and like Jesus. Paul says here in Romans 6, baptism is about all of them. That's a lot, right? Maybe some of you are like, I never really knew baptism was about all that stuff. That's exactly what Paul says right here. So that's why at Ecclesia we love to baptize people. We baptize six people since the church is planted. We're, it's not like we're just bursting at the seams. But every time, I mean, the first time we baptized two guys in my parents' pool. Second time we baptized two people at the Civic Center. And then the next time we baptized two people right here. And we got the whole floor wet and we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> but we didn't care. Because we didn't know how we were going to get the water out of the baptismal tank. We just knew that we needed to get it in and we're going to dump people to the glory of God. Amen? <laughs> so we, we've got a, another guy that's going to be baptized hopefully in a few weeks that we'll get, we'll get to there. <laughs> but we celebrate baptisms, right? Because it's about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's about our death, burial, and resurrection. And we're going to be alive someday with Jesus completely new. Amen? Amen. That's what baptism is about. Question two. That was the longest one, just so you know. <laughs> we got to make sure that we understand what it's about. And then we're going to answer some questions that are maybe kind of common. So what is baptism? We got that. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what Jesus has accomplished and that we get to reap all the benefits of what Jesus has accomplished. That's the gospel. Question two. How do we baptize? Do we sprinkle water? Do we pour water over people? Do we, what's called, immerse them? Do we dunk them? You know, Presbyterian, sprinkle, pour, Methodist, sprinkle, pour, you know, Catholic, sprinkle, pour, that kind of stuff. Baptist kind of got their name because the, the Greek word baptizo that's used in the scripture for baptism, it means to immerse, which means to go all the way under the water. And even his, even theological dinosaurs that we still look to today that are just awesome guys, like Martin Luther and John Calvin, they didn't agree on what we agree the Bible actually says about baptism. They did infant baptism, and they did sprinkling or pouring. We disagree with that because we believe the Bible does. But they even agreed. The Greek word baptizo means to dunk. I'm like, okay, so, well, since it means, let's just go on. Since it means that, let's do that. How do we baptize? Do we sprinkle, do we pour, or do we dunk people under the water? If you look at the Dutch translation of the Bible, John the Baptist, as we see in here, they called him John the Dunker. <laughs> he was dunking people to the glory of God. How do we baptize? 
Paul told us, what did Paul tell us in Romans 6? Baptism is about Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. So if baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, maybe we should do it like that. Let's go to a few places in Scripture. I want you to see this. This is what we believe at Ecclesia, that baptism is immersion. You are you go under the water. We dunk you under. It doesn't matter how you do it. We just push you down and bring you up, or if we do the rock or the tip. But it's because it's about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that we do it as an outward showing. We believe that the Scripture teaches we say the gospel to people, we speak the gospel to people, and also in our lives, we show the gospel. This would be by loving people, by serving people, by someone does something bad to you, and you give them grace, and you don't make them pay for it. And this is also, in the church, we have sacraments, as they're called, which is baptism and the Lord's Supper, which show the gospel. The Lord's Supper, we take it every week because it shows that Jesus' blood was poured out for us, free of charge. And that Jesus' body was broken for us on the cross for our sin. And so we get to, since he did that, we get to receive him, right? So you come to this table, and you don't have to bring $20 and put a $20 bill down and then get your wine or your juice and your bread. You come how? <coughs> you come with empty hands. And you come to get what Jesus has done and who he is. Baptism's like that as well. It shows the life, death, <coughs> burial, and resurrection of Jesus. A few scriptures. Let's go to that next one. John chapter 3, verse 23. This is John the baptizer, baptizing people. It says this, John also was baptizing at Anon near Selim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. Why does there need to be water that is plentiful there if you're pouring or you're sprinkling? It doesn't need to be. You don't have to have a lot of water. The reason they would go to these rivers is because there was a lot of water and it was deep enough for you to dunk someone and immerse someone. See that? Let's go to one more. How about Jesus' baptism? Jesus was baptized. If baptism saves, it kind of makes it pointless that Jesus was baptized. Did Jesus need to be saved? No. Never sinned. But let's look at how Jesus was baptized. And I say, for me... I want to baptize people, and I want to be baptized in the same way that the Lord Jesus Christ was. Amen? How was Jesus baptized? In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized. The very word means don't immerse. By John in the Jordan River. And when he came up out of the water... Some people say, well, that just means they were kind of down in the river, and then when he walked up onto the bank and he came up out of the water. No, it very literally means when Jesus came up out of the water. Then we know what happens. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, anointing him for ministry. And God the Father speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. But what I want you to see, and you can just go to countless places that keep showing how we should Baptize. The word means dunk, immerse. And we see right here, if you see, and I believe Acts, I can't remember what chapter exactly, but when Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch, he says, hey, there's a body of water here. Can I be baptized? And he goes, sure. And it says that Peter and the eunuch went down into the water to dunk him. You think that guy, this guy was an Ethiopian eunuch. He was an official for Ethiopia, and he's traveling in a huge chariot. You think he didn't have water? He had water. And if baptism was pouring or sprinkling over someone, he could have just said, hey, I got water right here. Can you pour it over me, and I'll be baptized? No, he said, he understood the gospel, he believed in the gospel, he trusted in Jesus, and he said, well, there's the body of water, can I go be baptized? Philip says, yep. And so he goes and he's dumped. So we believe that baptism is to be immersed because it's a picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You with me? Next question. Who should be baptized? This is a big one. You have basically two streams of thought in the church at large. You have what's called paedo-baptism, and you have what's called credo-baptism. Pado is the Latin word that means child or infant. Credo is the Latin word that means I believe. So it means believe, believer. 
So you have basically credo-baptism, which believes infants should be baptized, and then you have believer's baptism, which we at Ecclesia hold to, because the Bible does, that once you come to faith in Jesus, you're baptized, showing what Jesus has done, you believe in that, this is going to happen to you, you're on Jesus' team. So what does the scripture say? There are many good Bible teachers that love Jesus, that teach the Bible really well, that would disagree with me. And that would maybe disagree with what you believe as well. This doesn't mean they're on a different team, because they believe in infant baptism, and they don't believe in believer's baptism. This is a secondary issue. I believe it's very important because it's a symbol and it's a picture of what Jesus has done for us and what will happen to us, so I believe we should get it right. But because someone does infant baptism, doesn't mean we say they're a heretic and they're leading people astray. No. Guys like Martin Luther, guys like John Calvin, guys like Tim Keller, guys like Tony Chavidjan, guys like R.C. Sproul, they hold to and believe in infant baptism. And the reason that they do that is they try to find in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the different covenants, they try to find continuity between the two. Say like, well, this was this in the Old Testament, and then this is this in the New Testament, and they're the same thing. So they try to say that circumcision in the Old Testament is essentially the same thing as baptism in the New Testament. The only problem with that is that the Bible doesn't say that. And it's kind of what they're saying. I see why some people land there, and that makes sense to them. But if you think about it, circumcision, it was a sign of faith. Just as baptism in the New Testament is a sign of faith in Jesus. Furthermore, circumcision was only done to the male children on the eighth day. Women couldn't even be circumcised. And you wouldn't want to be. <laughs> So you just don't, this is what I'll say, you're not going to find a direct line to infant baptism anywhere in the Bible. You're not going to see an example of infant baptism anywhere in the Bible. But what you see countless times are examples and the command to baptize those who trust in Jesus for salvation. Let's look at Mark 16. This is a great commission as recorded by Mark. And Jesus said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever... What's that word? Say it again. Whoever believes, believes and is baptized. baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. But who, who does it say? Who does Jesus say should be baptized? Believers. 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 That's it. All the way through the act, the account of Acts, the apostles go out, start sharing the gospel, people start coming to Jesus. People are always baptized after it says they received the word of the Lord. Or they believed on Jesus. Or even in Acts chapter 2 when Peter stands up and he proclaims the gospel to him. And they say, what should we do? He says, repent and be baptized. He had just got through telling them, it's not the law. It's not your lineage. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It's all about what Jesus had done. Turn to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so they say, what should we do? He says, turn to Jesus and be baptized. It says there are about 3,000 men that got saved that day. That's pretty awesome. Great baptism celebration, amen? amen? A lot of pictures of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus going on. But it's always believe and be baptized. So that's why we hold to that. We, that's what's called believer's baptism. Infant baptism, a lot of times in churches, in faithful churches, they don't say this is like what, this doesn't save the kid, this doesn't cover the kid, anything like that. This is just a mark that we're putting on them, a sign that we're going to raise them in the church. We're going to love them like Jesus has loved us, and we're going to preach the gospel to them, share the gospel, and they'll be saved when they trust in Jesus. And say, so that's great. That's, called, that's what we call dedicating your child to the Lord. That's great. That's not what baptism is. And you miss the beautiful picture of what baptism is when you try to make it this thing that you do to kids. And not this thing that you do to those who trust in Jesus. Well, some of you were baptized as babies. Some of you weren't, but some of you were. That's it's not like you're like I gotta hide. I was baptized as a baby. You don't have to hide. We love you. So, who should be baptized? Believers. Next question: Should I be baptized again? Good question for a lot of people. 
Around here, this question comes up a whole lot. Because as you know, and maybe it happened to you as well, you grew up in the church. You maybe made a profession of faith when you were young. Something happened, and then you got baptized. Maybe you got scared. Maybe your grandpa said he's going to get you a toy. Maybe it's at VBS, and they're saying, if you died on your way home, if your mom wrecked, and you flipped your car, and you died, would you go to hell? I don't know! So you can come forward and pray this prayer, be baptized, and you won't go to hell. Okay, I don't want to go to hell, it sounds bad. And then later in your life, maybe you realize, that wasn't real. I was pressured, I was guilted into it, maybe. And so I was baptized because I said, I want to be saved. Yeah, you should be baptized. Okay. This happens with quite a few people around here in the Bible Belt because, frankly, a lot of churches don't actually preach the true gospel, and they don't handle inviting people to come to Jesus in a biblical sense, but they do it in a sense of, you don't want to go to hell? Come, admit, believe, confess, pray this prayer to receive the Lord Jesus into your heart, and then be baptized. And people are like, cool. And they have no idea really what the gospel, what the good news of Jesus is, or that we're saved by grace through faith alone in the finished work of Jesus alone. And so people grow up thinking, well, yeah, I'm saved. I was baptized when I was like eight. I made the decision to ask God into my heart when, you know, I was like 10, so I'm good. But you're not a part of the church? No, I don't need that. You don't love Jesus? Yeah, yeah, sure I do. He says if you love him, you'll seek to obey him. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Should I be baptized again? And the way you answer this question is a little iffy. So I'm going to answer, Ephesians 4, 5 says this. It says, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What this means is there's one true Lord, there's one true faith, and that there's one true baptism. We don't believe that you should get baptized over and over and over again and... Like happens in some churches, honestly, that you do really bad for a while, and then you go to church camp or something like that, or there's a revival, and you feel really bad, and you come forward and say, I need to rededicate my life to Christ, and I probably need to be baptized again, because I've been really bad. They go, all right, we'll baptize you. We baptize more people this week. How many times have they been baptized? Only seven. Only seven. You should not be baptized again if you've actually been baptized. But if you've been baptized in, let's say, a cult, like the Mormon church, which isn't even a church, like Jehovah's Witnesses, those are cults. They don't preach the truth of the Bible. They have a different view of Jesus. They have a different view of salvation. They believe it's of works. Mormons believe that it's some Jesus plus all of our works plus Joseph Smith. You're not a Christian. You're not a church. You're a cult. <laughs> if you've been baptized into a cult, yeah, and you've come to faith in Jesus, you should be baptized. I'll say to you this too. If you were baptized as an infant and you've come to faith in Jesus, you should be baptized because you weren't. That wasn't baptism. That was getting wet. You with me? I want you to understand this because it's an, it comes down to whether or not you want to obey what Jesus told you to do. We've got a guy that's going to come and be baptized sometime soon who was baptized as an infant. He and I didn't even talk about it. We were talking about Jesus one day, and he's been a part of Ecclesia for a little bit, and he just said, I need to be baptized. I'm like, really? You haven't been baptized? He said, well, it was when I was a baby. But so well, what do you think baptism is? So I think it's an outward picture of what Jesus has done for us, and we're communicating that. We're you know, on his team. I'm like, that's a pretty good answer. Does the Bible say you should be baptized? He said, I think so. I think it does say that after you believe, you should be baptized. I said, that's a good answer, too. I think you should be baptized as well. That's hard for me to say it. Because he said, I should be baptized. And I want to say, yes, you should. Let me tell you why. Here's the six points. It's like, why do you think you should be baptized? <laughs> I was happy that God's kind of growing me in that stuff. It's awesome. But let me show you this in the scripture. Should I be baptized again? If you haven't been baptized after you became a believer, after you truly turned from sin to Jesus, yes, you should be baptized. We see this in Acts chapter 19. And this is Paul who's ministering. And it, it says, and he said to them, these guys that are saying they're, they're believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. 
So the answer is no. Notice first that Paul doesn't look for, were you baptized? Or did you pray this prayer? Um, or what church are you a part of? He says, he's trying to find out if people say, do you have the Holy Spirit? What he's saying is, do you love Jesus? Do you seek to obey Jesus? Have you been changed? Are you no longer enslaved to sin, but you're enslaved to Jesus, and you're seeking to follow him and glorify him? Do you have the Holy Spirit? They say, we don't even know there is one. So the answer is no, they don't. Continue. Verse 3, and he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul comes across some guys that have been baptized. They had been baptized in John's baptism, which was a baptism of, I realize that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I need to turn from my sin to the Savior. But it wasn't turn to Jesus. It was turn to the one that is to come. And they didn't yet know who was to come. So Paul comes along. Have you been baptized after you became a believer? Uh, no. Then you need to be baptized. What does it say they did? They were baptized. So maybe some of you, and you just got to lay down your pride. That's all it is with most of us. We got to say, I was baptized before, but I, it was really just getting wet. I, I didn't have living faith in the living Jesus. I was pressured. Maybe I was in a cult. Maybe it was when I was a kid. I'm sorry, but if you're a kid, if you're an infant, you didn't have a choice in the matter. Your parents dressed you up nice, probably, and had water poured over you. And when you're a kid, they don't dunk you, of course, because that would be child abuse. <laughs> should I be baptized again? Maybe. Maybe you should. I'd love to talk to you more about it. And I'd ask you to lay down your pride and say... You know what? This may hurt my parents' feelings. This may make my parents mad. We had one guy that was baptized in the church that he was baptized when he was about six, and his grandpa was the one who baptized him. Then he got saved. He really met Jesus and said, I need to be baptized again. And I know this is going to upset my grandpa, but I, I, it's a, I, I got to. Jesus tells me to. <clears throat> Question five. This is one of the one of the big ones. Does baptism save? There are some, they're not even churches. If they preach this, they're not a church. If anywhere preaches that your action of any kind saves you, they're not a church. They're not what the Bible calls a church. But if they're preaching <coughs> the finished work of Jesus alone in our place, and that we're saved by grace just through faith, through trusting in what Jesus has done, that's how we're saved, then they're a church. But if they don't preach that, don't even call them a church. They are leading people astray to trust in their own works for Jesus and not Jesus' works for them. You guys understand the difference? That's a big deal. If you think that something you did saved you, if I was baptized and so I'm saved, or if I prayed this prayer so I'm saved, or your whole life is going to be so messed up. You're not going to understand grace. You're not going to understand discipleship. You're not going to understand growth. You're going to think it's all about me. It's all about me. And it's all about me and what I can do and how I can be better. And you're just totally missing the point of the gospel. Does baptism save? What does Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 say? Read this. We're going to, we read this a whole lot in Ecclesia because this is one of the clearest places in Scripture that shows us how we're saved. <clears throat> For by... Grace. What's grace? <clears throat> it's unmerited favor. It's a gift. It's you deserved this on this end of the spectrum, and you've been given the thing on the very opposite end of the spectrum. You deserved the worst thing you could possibly get, and you were given the best thing you could possibly receive. That's grace. Unmerited favor. We did nothing to receive it. By grace you've been saved. Through faith. faith. And this is not your own doing. This is not your own doing is written in the Greek. It's neuter. I know that sounds weird to you guys, but it's the tone, it's the voice, it's how it's written. It's written to point back to everything that it's just said. Everything. So when you read the Greek, literally, it says, this is not your own doing. Your faith was not your own doing. 
fact that you're saved was not your own doing, and the fact that you received grace was not your own doing. That's why Paul writes that. Paul does so much work in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians and even in Ephesians that we are saved by faith alone in Jesus, not by any work of the law. And in Ephesians 2, 8, he gets down to the point that, listen guys, the fact that you trusted in Jesus was because grace was given to you. The grace opened you up to trust in Jesus. The very faith that you exercised in Jesus for salvation was a gift given to you. That's good news. It's not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. So why? <clears throat> so that no one can boast. If you're saved because you got baptized, you've got room to boast. If you're saved because you made the right decision to trust in Jesus, you got room to boast. If you're saved because you prayed this prayer, you got room to boast. But if you're saved by grace through faith, we just know, I got nothing. It's Jesus. I'm thankful. I want to live for him. I want to exalt him. We're saved by grace through faith. No work needed. No work necessary. The good news is that there's nothing you have to do. The good news is that there's nothing you can do to be saved. Just give up and trust in Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is salvation. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 says this. I want to drive this point home even more. Ready? <clears throat> Titus 3, 5 and 6. He, that is Jesus, saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. See that? Does it say anything about we allowed God to pour it out, pour it out on us? It just says he richly poured it out on us by his grace because of his mercy not according to anything that we did in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. He regenerated us. He saved us. You guys, we got to understand this, and we got to be able to communicate this to people. This is the gospel message. It's finished. It's grace. You don't deserve it. You'll never deserve it. But you can receive it through trusting in what Jesus has done in your place for your sins. Baptism doesn't save. Jesus saves you. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Doing good works doesn't save you. Jesus' good works save you. Repenting doesn't save. The one you turn to saves. Faith in the right thing doesn't save. The object of your faith is the one who saves. The fact that you reached out to God in faith didn't save you. He saved you. Because he reached down and grabbed you. If you're floating down a stream and you're about to go off a waterfall, stay with me. I know you guys are sleepy and you're tired of listening to me. Listen. <laughs> I love you. I want you to get this. If you're floating down a river and you're about to go off a waterfall and you see a branch and you're like, ah, and you grab hold of the branch, would you say, I saved myself by my arm strength? <laughs> no. That branch saved me. I just grabbed did the strength of your grip save you, or did the strength of the, the branch save you? If the branch wasn't strong enough, it wouldn't save you. You'd have grabbed and it would have broke off and you'd have kept going. If you're falling off a cliff and you just reach up for a root and you grab it, did your grabbing save you, or did the root save you? Root. The object of our faith saves us. Jesus saves us. Confessing your sin to a holy man doesn't save the only holy man, Jesus, saves. Thinking the truth is that everyone will be saved in the end doesn't save. Being a universalist or thinking like a universalist doesn't save. The one you're trying to deny in that, Jesus, saves by his grace. So if baptism is quick. So if baptism doesn't save. The scripture says it doesn't save. If it doesn't save, if, the, if baptism doesn't make the Holy Spirit come on us, and we, like, summon it down by being baptized. Why should we be baptized then? What's the point? It doesn't save. It doesn't give us the Holy Spirit. Why? Obedience to Jesus. This comes up in a lot of things lately. It's like, well, if God's really sovereign in salvation, why do we share the gospel? Because Jesus told us to. 
Oh, I think that's enough. If baptism doesn't save us, why do we be baptized then? We don't get something awesome and cool. We're not saved get the Holy Spirit from it. Why should we be baptized? Jesus told us to. <coughs> All right. It's an act of worship. It's an act of obedience. I don't even have to read this to you. The Great Commission says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He starts that Great Commission with saying, Hey, I got all authority in heaven and on earth. Go baptize people when they come to faith in me. Go, so, well, that's pretty serious. Maybe we should baptize people when they come to faith. Maybe you should be baptized. I want you to think through this. If, if you've come to faith in Jesus, even if you were baptized when you were younger, or when you were an infant, but you weren't really in Christ, and now you are in Christ, why not be baptized? Why? Is it pride? Is it because you don't think it's important enough? Is because, well, it doesn't really have anything to do with my salvation, so it's not that big of a deal. I'm already saved. I'm good. Okay. What about Jesus told you to? Some of you need to be obedient and be baptized. Some of you need to understand what baptism is and rejoice in it and seek to see other people come to faith in Jesus and be baptized. The next time we have a baptism, we're going to celebrate and cheer, right? It's all about Jesus. Jesus <clears throat> saved us by grace. He shows us. He frees us. From sin. Some of you have been baptized. Some of you have, are in Christ, but you're not growing. And you're not even trying. Some of you need to repent from your apathy. You need to repent from not studying the Bible. Men, you need to repent from not leading your wife in a Bible study. Boyfriend, you need to repent from not leading your girlfriend in a Bible study. Husband, I weigh heavy on you guys because you're the leaders of your home. And if you're not leading your wife to Jesus, if you're not opening the Bible and discussing the scripture and loving them and praying with them, you're being disobedient and you're living in sin. You need to turn from that. Your wife's going to follow your lead and you're to lead your wife. So do it. It's joyful. I promise you, when you start opening up the Bible and lead your wife and being obedient to what Jesus tells you, it's joyful. Your wife is going to grow. You're going to grow closer to one another. Because you're centered on the only thing that really matters. Jesus. Amen? I know that's a hard word for some of you to hear, but you need to freaking grow up. <laughs> you're not a kid anymore. I'm looking at myself, too. You're not a kid anymore. Grow up. <laughs> <coughs> if you're dating someone, ladies, if he's not going to lead you to Jesus... Ditch him and run away. Wives, if your husband's not leading you in a Bible study, tell him, start leading me. I love you, and I love Jesus, and I need you to lead me. And if he doesn't, tell me, and I'll punch him. Because I love him. I just love you guys. You guys understand what baptism is? Yes. It's good news, right? Yeah. It's awesome. I wish that we had somebody to baptize today. We do. <laughs> But we're going to celebrate the next time that we do. <coughs> I want to end with this. It's a quote by Charles Spurgeon. It really drives home the point of we're saved by grace, and we know that we're going to be made new and made alive with Jesus by grace. This is what he said in one of his sermons. <coughs> if heaven were by merit, if it were by our good works, it would never be heaven to me. For if I were in it, I should say, I'm sure I'm here by mistake. I have no claim to it. This is not my place. But if it be of grace and not of works, then we may walk into heaven with boldness. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. You don't deserve it and you never will. But we get it. Because Jesus gives it to us graciously. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pray. We're going to celebrate and sing. Can we do that? Yeah. We actually have a reason to celebrate and sing. I know there's not as many of us here today, and some of us are probably like, wow, oh, man, it's just not as not many people, not as many as loud. Let's freaking yell. Let's celebrate. Let's sing. Let's stand up with me. I'm going to pray, and Bo and Megan and McLean are going to come, and we're going to worship. And we're going to take the Lord's Supper.
If you're in Christ, this is for you. Come with your hands open and empty. And come and take the bread and the cup that was given for you. Jesus' body, Jesus' blood. Repent of sin. Spend some time in prayer. I love you guys. Let's